Yeah, there's no way. There is absolutely no way this is gonna fit inside this case. Aces, my friends. What are you doing? Jesus Christ. This is bigger than the case, isn't it? Hey guys, AMD is releasing another set of CPUs. And rather than going for the X3D variant that everybody's expecting, we're now going for the lower wattage unit. And based on specs, they don't actually look that different. What we've got here is a 7700 non-X. It's a 65 watt, eight core CPU. And what we're gonna do is rather than going deep into the benchmarking and provide you a bunch of graphs comparing to the other CPUs, we're gonna make a build. And it'll be a somewhat disbalanced build because we're gonna have a about mid-range CPU with the highest end graphics card that they have, the 7900 XTX. We're gonna build it out in a quad mini cube case by Techware and see how it really performs. So let's get right into it. Before we get too deep into the case itself, we'll build out most of the components on the motherboard and then slot that into the case. For our motherboard, we're using an Asus ROG Strix X670EI Gaming, which is their ITX board. So it's the smallest board that they have and it's also the highest end board that they have for the Ryzen 7000 series. With the latest generation of Asus boards, there are a few notable differences, especially with the ITX boards. Now you get this little additional controller, which is there to control your sound. Uh, you have a few preset buttons, uh, as well as your audio out. So you can actually control the, leave this on your desk and control everything on your desk, which is kind of cool. And it does save some space on the motherboard itself. Uh, as you can see here, Rather than just having one fan on the inside, you also have a little fan at the bottom down here. And you still maintain the fan for the VRM at the top here. Also, if you don't want to hurt yourself, they now have little covers for the fan headers. I'm thinking if they got the, them here, why not cover up the RGB headers as well? Which makes it more convenient, but hey, at least you got something. All right, let's start building out. So what, what I'll do is I'll probably start with the CPU. Because this is still an early release, we receive the CPU that's on a little plastic cover, but also is a cooler. So this release will actually have coolers with the whole lineup. And in this particular case, Ryzen 7 and Ryzen 9 share the same cooler. So even though the CPU will probably run a bit cooler anyway, um, having a better cooler is actually an advantage to people getting Ryzen 7. But we'll see how it performs under their stock cooler. I actually have no intention of changing this. I want to keep it stock and see what the performance will be with the stock cooler. All right, for the installation, just follow the standard process. You open up the little cover. Find the little triangle. CPU is on, uh, what we can do next is, we're actually using um, Kingston Fury uh, DDR5 memory. Uh, this is actually a 6800 mega transfer speed kit, uh, but Ryzen CPUs don't really go past 6400 in most cases. Uh, so we'll see if we can use the full potential of this RAM stick. But we're gonna have a look at that a bit later on. Align it the right way around, and you click it in. So the colors in this particular example line up, and the Fury logo actually looks really, really cool together with the Asus ROG. This looks like it was meant to be. Next, what we're gonna do is install a 990 Pro SSD from Samsung. Uh, this is currently their fastest in the lineup. And in the near future, they're gonna have a four terabyte version of this. Uh, by the way, we have a video on our channel already, so check it out if you wanna see how that performs. What we need to do is remove the, this heatsink here to access the following heatsink. So this is gonna be our PCI Gen 2, that's a chipset heatsink. I'm gonna go deeper to get to the bottom side of this. That's how deep we're getting in. What we can do now is install our NVMe drive just here, straight into this slot over here. And it's so tight in there that I actually have to use a screwdriver to lock it in. That's our NVMe SSD installed. To utilize the maximum potential of this heatsink, make sure to take off the little plastic cover. Otherwise, you'll be heating up plastic for no particular reason. And by the way, one of the things that is kind of nice with these CPUs, they still have the same amount of PCE lanes. So actually, both of these drives could be connected directly to the CPU. So you get ultra-fast storage without the, any bottlenecks from the chipset. 
uh, which is a nice little addition. So it turns out I didn't actually need to remove both these heat sinks. I could have just got away with one of them. It's such a huge heating tower on the side of this though. Just all heating and all the different component stuff. We'll make components in it to make our life a bit easier. What we can do now is install this little expansion card. Uh, it just installs using these USB type C connectors. And it's just a card that provides us extra panel connectors as well as extra USB ports if needed. And it just kind of sticks out here. And you can connect things up from it. Also, uh, I really like that ASUS provides this little expansion cable uh, where you can just plug in your uh, I.O. cables straight in and you have nicely labeled cables for your front I.O. and whatnot on the side. Uh, so you, you can plug it in and then you can deal with all the fiddly bits later on uh, at the back of the case or to the side and you don't have to mess around with it as you're building out, which is nice. And this one, I believe, goes right here. Just plug that in and you're good to go. So now I can just pull it towards the back of the board and it's kind of nice and neat and you can deal with it at the back. One final thing to do is install the included cooler. Um, if you do buy the CPU, this cooler would probably be in a nicer box, but for us, it's just a generic box with the cooler inside. But it is chonkers and it does have RGB. What's nice is it also has pre-applied thermal paste, which makes it easier for newbies to install. You'll see these two little clips over here. Um, you need to kind of attach it from one side and secure it from the other. Uh, what, you, what you want to do is start on the side, which doesn't have a little clip, and then finish with this one and then secure it down. That side is in. You bring it over here and you just twist it across so it just clips. And now it's nice and solid on. And take the fan connector. In this case, we need to unplug the CPU fan. So you'll see a little labelings on the actual motherboard. Um, if you look very closely over here next to the fans, it says a CPU cooler, and then it has AAO. So you uh, unplug the CPU side. Um, in this case, ASUS actually have it in a different color. Just drop the little rubber thing and you can plug this cable into it, right here. If you want to cable tie it or cable manage it better, you can plug it in and just stuff it underneath over here. So it looks neat and as if you planned it. One more thing that this cooler comes with is RGB. This little connector over here goes inside the cooler itself and this larger one goes inside your motherboard for controlling the RGB. And on the cooler side, you have two little connectors right here. Uh, they did have little plastic, so you need to remove them, and then you can plug the cable in. This is obviously an optional uh, device. Um, you don't have to have RGB, um, but it'll make it look pretty, so why not? And then for the RGB, in this board, the, there are two RGB ports at the top. You got the standard RGB, and you got an ARGB. Uh, this particular case uh, is using a, a ARGB connector. With the cooler installed, we can now proceed with installing the whole thing inside the case. So this is the case we're building in. Um, it's called Cube. Let me just take off all the panels, uh, which this case is actually pretty good about, is you can actually remove essentially everything to get the access in. Uh, it almost feels like uh, Asus and uh, Tecwa have spoken and made sure that their colors actually align because this looks Actually pretty clean. Um, let's carry on and install the graphics card and then start routing the cable. And I actually didn't check. This is actually not that much space. I wonder if our graphics card is gonna fit. Yeah, there's no way. There is absolutely no way this is gonna fit inside this case. Aces, my friends. What are you doing? Jesus Christ. This is bigger than the case, isn't it? Hello. 
What do I? <laughs> this isn't working. So, change of plans. Uh, as you can see, we have a new case, and uh, I hope this one will work. And the problem is, well, the new, very power hungry, very hot running graphics cards that require coolers like this. And ultimately, if you look at it side by side with this case, it takes up more than half of the case. Even this tall case, it still doesn't look particularly big. And that's the problem we have with most cases in our stock. A lot of them are actually about the length of this card and they just won't work. Let's get in and start building. Um, I'll just disassemble this case quickly and then we can start plopping things inside. The one thing that I wish this case had is a bigger power supply mounting position because you can only mount an SFX or SFXL power supply here and that's it. You're kind of screwed when it comes down to really high end um, parts. At the same time, we're building this system with low powered CPU, which then powered up with a really high powered graphics card may actually be okay for this 650 watt power supply. But let's see if transients actually knock it offline and stop us from playing games. Let's have a look. It literally just slots in right here. And what happens is you already have this little extension cable. You can just plug it in over here. Before that, and just screw it all in. Pass plays in. This is the cable you go through. You just kind of slot it right here. Because I'm using an SFX power supply rather than SFXL, you have a bit more space over here for cable management and kind of routing it all around. There's actually a nice little benefit. In this particular case, this power supply comes only with two PCIe cables. Um, they do have this little expansion thing, but that's not ideal. Uh, but let's see how it performs. Uh, let me just route it all in and uh, we'll show you what it looks like in this case once it's all set up. With the power supply installed and cables pulled out, as you can see in here, there's still loads of space in this case for installing a larger cooler or well, really anything else. Um, this does support a larger motherboard should you wish to install one. Now let's install the largest part of this build, which is this bad boy here. Um, and I hope we can just easily squeeze that inside. Easily is a strong word. It is fitting, but I actually have it just, it's just standing now on top of the bottom uh, fan. It's in. This is a very tight fit. To give you an example of how little space there is between this fan and this graphics card, is this is a, actually a really small piece of plastic for the CPU thermal paste spreading. It doesn't go, I can't squeeze it in. It actually doesn't go further in this. And uh, the other thing is, because it's a vertical mount, majority of the weight is going to be on the bracket up here. Therefore, it's not going to lean down. You don't need, need any special brackets to hold it up in place. So that's kind of a nice spot. With the build complete and all the cables somewhat neatly tucked away, it doesn't really matter in this build, but uh, we did do a little bit of cable management. It's a moment of truth. Let's turn it on and see if it works. Hopefully it works. If it's gonna post, then we're good here and then we can move on to doing benchmarking. Yes, okay. Now that we're booted, we know it works. So I can get into benchmarking and bring you the results you are looking for. With the testing complete, I want to give a shout out to Asus with its ROG Hub accessory. I really like the single click PBO toggle and the magnetic mount. With this case, it is super flexible. Let's now talk about our findings. But first, quick brief on our setup. We've enabled RAM overclock to 6400 mega transfers and left the rest of the settings at default, which nowadays includes smart access memory being enabled. Then we ran all the tests with stock CPU settings and afterwards with PBO enabled. We will also include some of our CPU benchmark results for comparison in some of our tests. However, please keep in mind that these results may not be directly comparable because we've used an open air test bench with a more powerful cooler than the one that comes with the CPU. Despite this, we thought it might be useful for some people to see comparisons. For productivity, consider Cinebench R23 test. With the single core setting, the results are nearly identical, but enabling PBO in multi-core testing leads to 6% increase in the score. In V-Ray, the difference between stock settings and PBO is a significant 7%.
this is noticeable improvement from just a one-click boost. However, there is an important caveat to consider, which will be discussed a bit later on. Also, if you're enjoying this video, please consider subscribing for more tech videos like this. Next test is our standard CPU render using Blender, and here we throw in some of our results from the standard setup. Again, a quick reminder that these are not directly comparable and should only be used as a guidance. In this test, the difference between stock and PBO is yet again about 6.5%, but if we get to compare the PBO results to 7700X, the difference is just over 2%. Not bad from a low power chip. However, it's something to note that while the 77 non X has TDP of 65 watt, it can reach 90 watt at full load, and enabling PBO increases that to 130 watt. While this is still lower than 140 watts on the X version, it's just getting really close. Although the 44% increase in power does result in only 6.5% performance boost, I don't personally think it's worth it. That's why I appreciate the external controller from Asus, which allows you better control and personalization of the performance boost. You can enable PPO on the fly to get some extra performance and then disable it once you're done. Another thing to note here is that PPO causes CPU to get hot and in turn much louder as CPU cooler needs to cool it down and it works much harder. At stock, we're staying under 80 degrees, and with PBO, we quickly jump to 95 degrees and stay there. I feel this is where, with a higher end cooler, you may be able to squeeze a little bit more performance out of this chip if you really wanted to. I've also included another graph for those interested in the frequencies we observed in both modes. With PBO enabled, it hits 5 GHz on all cores and then started to drop down due to the thermal constraints. Moving on to gaming. I'll keep this brief as most of the modern CPUs are more than capable of running games at high frame rates, even at high resolutions like 1440p and 4K. The GPU is often a limiting factor rather than the CPU. At least with these graphs, you'll be able to see expected performance from a fully built up system like this. Let's start with Horizon Zero Dawn, and here the difference between stock and PBO is so small that PBO looks like it's below stock. That is because it is within run to run variants. Realistically, unless you have 5% difference between the results, it's not really worth even considering. In Formula 1 2022, we have very much the same story. All the results are matching up. In Borderlands 3, while at 1080p, we see a slight performance uplift from PBO being enabled. What is interesting is the FPS per 100 watts. Here, we have a slight improvement too. In Shadow of a Tomb Raider, we also have no real changes between stock and PBO mode, while we have our settings set to high. Ultimately, it's because most of the work is happening on the GPU side. For the sake of validating that statement, we turn down both settings and resolution to 720p to remove any possible GPU bottlenecks, and now we see slight performance uplift from PBO mode being enabled. With this in mind, we've got one more game where PBO actually shines, and it is World War Z, where at 1080p we have about 10% improvement on an average FPS and 11% improvement on one percentiles. Also, we see about 12% higher FPS per watt, which leads us well to the conclusion. The new Ryzen 7700 chip is certainly low power, but not necessarily lower performance. The fact that AMD allows you to overclock it provides plenty of flexibility, and the included cooler is a good starting point for most users. If you do 1440p gaming and above, then there's absolutely no need of getting anything higher than this. Save your money and get a higher end GPU or better memory. I was also pleasantly surprised with Asus motherboard and the aforementioned PBO toggle. It is an easy way of temporary boost performance at the cost of thermals and power efficiency, and can be done on the fly without any overclocking knowledge. On the other hand, if you're interested in doing some overclocking, then this chip may still have a lot more up its sleeve. What do you guys think about it? Let us know in the comments below if you would consider this new non-X chips from AMD. Also, if you want to check out any of the items covered in the video, the links are in the description below. I hope you found this useful. Don't forget to smash that thumbs up and subscribe for more. We'll see you guys in the next one.